fasting within the month of Ramadan. So we just had Eid, Alhamdulillah, so we're strong. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That sounds better. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen nabiyyina Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina thumma amma ba'd. After praising Allah and sending salam and salutations to the noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. He is one and he has no partners. And I also testify that the noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger and slave of Allah, the Almighty. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate to be in the monthly event organized by Al Falak Da'wah Project. I'm thankful to the team at the Al Falak Da'wah Project and Stephanie Shahadal Al Masjid for organizing this very auspicious, beneficial event every now and then. Jazakumullah khairan. And the topic that we are actually going to discuss today is absolutely crucial and absolutely important as our uh, respected Maulana Yaqub uh, mentioned earlier. Every one of us here, every single, each and every single Muslim appreciate and understands the needs of unity. If you ask any Muslim about the importance of unity, they would say, yes, we Muslims have to be united. Symposiums, seminars, conferences take place to emphasize and to uh, discuss about the importance of unity amongst the Muslims, amongst the humanity. So no one here that we don't understand the importance of unity. We all know the verse in the Noble Quran where Allah the Almighty says, Inna hadhi ummatukum ummatan wahida. This is one ummah and this is one uh, concept of one nation, one ummah. We all know the, the believers are like brothers. We all know that hold the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together and do not be divided and disunited. We all know these verses. They're very common and often and frequently discussed by the scholars, by the preachers, by dua. But yet, we still see the Muslims are dividing day by day. Muslims are disuniting more and more. Muslims are fighting amongst themselves. Muslims dislike and hate one another. And this is a sad reality. If we understand the importance of unity, al ukhuwa brotherhood, al ittihad then why are we still divided? In my humble opinion, I believe that we understand the importance of unity and brotherhood. But we, in reality, many of us, if not all, but many, many of us, including scholars and preachers, and of course, normal Muslims, the, 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 the normal uh, Muslim uh, ummah, people, every one of us, or many of us, I would say, that we do not work towards the unity, meaning we do not do practical or do not take practical steps to unite the ummah, to unite the community, to unite the people. We do not take the practical steps and this is where we fail. Even though we understand but we are doing certain things, we are going to be speaking in probably conferences amongst the scholars that we have to be united. But when we come back home, we speak against each other. We do things that actually cause the disunity hatred, division amongst the, uh, the Ummah. And we all also recognize the importance of the unity because unity is strength. We all say that unity is strength. 
Without unity, there is not a strength. And you know how people used to use the phrase that divide and conquer. The more you divide people, the, 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 the more you, uh, you conquer. And that's how people use up their the tactic or the technique to, uh, to, to make sure the Muslims are divided, the Muslims are, are disunited. Um, now, I'd like to also make this um, talk quite inclusive. I just don't want to talk you know, uh, by myself, so inshallah everyone participate in this way, maybe you become a bit more interested. What do you think, brothers? Inshallah? So I'll ask some questions, inshallah. Please, please try and participate according to best knowledge. Um, is there any difference between division and difference of opinions? Can anyone answer? Is there a difference between division and difference of opinions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there is different uh, difference. What are the differences? If you don't. Division, like, uh, it's like uh, splitting, grouping. Yes, splitting. Good. Difference of opinion. Difference of opinion is like ikhtilaf. Uh, okay. Ikhtilaf. So, ikhtilaf is okay. So there is a, a difference between the division, yes, division and difference of opinions. Difference of opinions were always there and it will always be there and it can never be minimized. Difference of opinions. I mean, I'm talking about the Sharia, I'm talking about Sahaba, I'm talking about the Imams. Aimma, al fuqaha the jurist, the mainstream scholars of Islam. There were differences of opinions between Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa and Sahaba, and there were differences of opinions amongst the Sahaba themselves, the companions, the rightly guided companions. There were differences of opinions amongst the Imams of Islam, the early scholars of Islam, and it will always remain the difference of opinions. But they were not disunited. They were not divided. They differed with one another based on the Quran and Sunnah, based on the original sources of the evidences. But they still respected each other. They still loved one another. They still honored each other, even though they had different opinions. So they had different opinions, and there is scholarly different opinions, academic different opinions, but yet they would still respect one another. Take the example of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i Rahimahullah. We all know Imam Abu Hanifa, he had his own school of fiqh. And Imam Shafi'i was from a different school. And they had their debates. They had the different opinions. You know, just for no reason, there would be two, there wouldn't be two different schools. For no reason, two different major schools. But yet, Imam al-Shafi'i, when he arrived in Iraq, what did he do? The first thing he did, that he went to the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa and he did the ziyarah. He visited the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa and he prayed two rakat salah there and he made dua for Imam Abu Hanifa. Allah. That kind of love amongst the uh, early scholars they had, even though they had difference of opinions. So difference of opinions, which is known as al-ikhtilaf, between the ulama, scholars, is not disunity and it's not division which many assume or which many may perceive or assume that these are divisions or disunity. No, we always have different opinions. Different opinions in tafsir. Take the tafsir of the Al-Quran Al-Kareem, the, the, the commentaries of the Quran, and you see Imam Ibn Kathir said something, Imam Al-Razi said something else, Imam Al-Qurtubi said something else, Imam, uh, Imam uh, you have different, different scholars of tafsir, and sometimes they have different interpretation of maybe one verse. You, we have different opinions amongst the scholars of, of hadith. We have different opinions amongst the scholars of aqidah. And we have different opinions amongst the scholars of, of fiqh and tajweed. And we find, even in tajweed, there are different opinions amongst the scholars of Islam. Or scholars of tajweed. So, there is a difference between the division, disunity, and al ikhtilaf difference of opinions amongst the scholars. And different opinions amongst the scholars do not break the Ummah and do not disunite the Ummah. It's always been the case. Right. Now, 
what are the causes of disunity and division amongst Muslims? We need to find out and we need to identify these causes and we need to make sure that we don't do them in order to bring the Ummah together, in order to bring the brotherhood amongst the Muslims once again, love and affection once again to the, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, oppressed Ummah that has been oppressed all over the world and this Ummah that is suffering tremendously across the world because of their inner conflict, because of their internal conflict, because of their disunity and because of their division and because of the hatred amongst themselves. Right. So number one, according to my research, I would say number one, that um, we always have the competition mentality. So we have different different groups amongst the Muslims. Muslim community, which is not bad. But the problem is that we have the competition in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. So what I mean by competition is that if the other group has done, some, done, some, done something good, that even though it's good and beneficial and productive, I will still not appreciate it. I will still speak against it. So, again, if another scholar which probably I don't maybe follow or I don't take him as my shape or scholar. If it's coming from him, even though it's the right thing, I would still say it's not right. I will reject it and I will condemn it. Competition mentality. Even though people are doing, maybe I'm not, I'm not belonging to a specific circle or specific uh, organization or specific group. And if the people out there, other organizations are doing good things, it's just because coming from or it's being done or organized by other organizations, even if it's good, I'm not still happy. I would still speak evil or I would still speak bad about the uh, activities or actions or, or maybe uh, the work that's been done and produced by other organizations or groups or other circles or other scholars. And we find this. As long as we think that if it's not from my scholar and if it's not from my teachers, then we... It doesn't mean that you have to go to every scholar. It doesn't mean that you have to be part of every organization or every Tao or every circle. But I mean condemning, attacking, refuting, just because it's coming from another person or another group or another organization. This is, I believe, a big cause of the disunity. And we must, as Muslims, must be fair and just in every situation and in every circumstance. Allah Taala in the Holy Quran, be with the fairness and justice even if it goes against yourself. And I've been just hearing yesterday a scholar was saying that this verse, it's written in the most prestigious university in the world, Harvard University University, where it says that be with the justice even if it, even if it goes against yourself. One of the best expression of fairness and we must be fair. If it's coming, if the words of truth are coming from any scholar, any organization, then we must be open and we must be happy to accept because it's true. It is truth. And the truth is coming. Al Hikmat al that you know the wisdom is a lost property of a Muslim wherever they find to take it. Unfortunately, we may not we don't have problems taking from non Muslims. And I don't say of course we can learn from anybody as human beings. But many of us, if it's coming from non-Muslims, we don't have a problem. But if it's coming from a Muslim, and it's just because like, he doesn't, he's not from my circle, then I would just reject it. And I will just, just, just like completely ignore it or condemn or even attack. So, you know, there, there's no pure, uh, uh, purified hearts and souls to, uh, to purify hearts and souls uh, to accept the truth regardless of the sources or regardless of the background. So we always remain with the truth and we don't go with the faces of the people who, who actually, who are mentioning, who are saying. So we have to reduce and get rid of the competition mentality. We have to wish good for other people. We must learn to appreciate and acknowledge and wish the good for other people, even though they may not be our scholar, they may not be our circle, or they may not be part of our method, or they may not be part of our Muslim that we follow. But we have to learn to accept and respect others. And this is what we're talking about in the worldly matters. We must not compete in a bad way. But yes, Islam encourages people to compete in a good way. So Prophet said, sorry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Noble Quran, 
that compete with one another in good things. And this is the reason why uh, there are Quran competitions, there are Hadith competitions, which is good, because to achieve something that is good. But in the Hadith of Rasulullah in Adab al Mufrad, uh, on the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said in a hadith that Iyakum wa dhan, beware, be careful of excessive thoughts or mistrust or negative thoughts. Because the negative thoughts are, 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 are much of them are fairy tales, they lie, they, they, they're not the true conversation. So Prophet said, don't be jealous, don't hate one another, do not have hatred for each other. ولا تنافسوا. And then he says, do not compete with one another. What competition is he talking about? In a bad way. Just because you want to win, you argue for hours and hours. Just because you want to win, you speak and you fight. Just because you win, you want to win. And just because you want to make sure that your individual, your personality, your ego or your chef or your group is better, you don't mind even labeling others and you don't mind degrading others and defaming others. This is wrong. That kind of tanafus is wrong and causing disunity amongst the Muslims. Right. Number two, again, according to my understanding and observation, that when we come to correct and when we come to do islah, when we come to uh, 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 correct the mistakes, or maybe we think, we might, we might be thinking that the other person is doing something wrong. When we come to correct or do islah or uh, rectify, our approach is not the brotherly approach. Approach of correction is not brotherly approach. So when we come and go and correct somebody, we, talk, we speak very harshly. We speak very rudely. And how do you think that you can change a person if you're rude and harsh? Your first impression is wrong. So when we go and talk to people, we have no tolerance, we have no kindness, we have no love and affection. And we have many times. I mean, I get surprised. Many of us, we we are with non-Muslims. We are very polite. We are. We speak about tolerance. We talk about. Uh, we talk about compassionate. We talk about kindness. We talk about love and affection and brotherhood and tolerance. Most importantly, when we speak to and dialogue with non-Muslims, and which is good. I don't. I don't. I don't mean to say that it's bad. It's good to be polite with even any person, any human being. But I get surprised when I see that we are very polite with the people of other faith, but when it comes to Muslim, we are very harsh. We are very rude. We speak very bluntly. And we have no mercy and compassion, and we have no kindness, and we have no tolerance with the Muslims. Right? And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is he saying? What is he teaching us? He's teaching us the great, some of the most important remarks that he made. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in a hadith, important hadith, he said, لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمنوا That none of you will enter into Jannah until you believe. Meaning, until you become a true, a complete believer. You will not, gonna be, you, you will not be able to enter the Jannah until you become a true believer. ولا تؤمنوا حتى تحابوا And then he said, that none of you become a true believer until you learn how to love one another. Until you learn how to love each other. Not hate one another, not to be rude and harsh just because the other person is not on your opinion. Just because the other person doesn't agree with you maybe in some ways. Or maybe you haven't even explained to him properly. You haven't convinced him properly. Prophet said, Wala tu'minu hatta tahabu. None of you become true believer until you learn to love one another for the sake of Allah wa wa ta'ala. You know the importance of love amongst the brother, amongst Muslims. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّ فِي اللَّهِ وَاجْتَمَعَ عَلَيْهِ وَتُفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ That one of the seven groups of people who will be sheltered refuge by Allah on the day of Qiyamah is two people that love one another for the sake of Allah and when they departed, they also departed for the sake of Allah. They loved for the sake of Allah and they departed for the sake of Allah, separated for the sake of Allah as well. Now, as I said, no brotherly approach. And I'm sure you've witnessed this. And I've seen in my experience, in my, uh, in my uh, you know, educational life, I've seen many people, they're very harsh when they come to correct people. They are not compassionate, they're not, uh, uh, they're not merciful, they're not tolerant when it comes to Muslims. Just because he's not from my manhab, from my school, from my maslak, and from my line or group. 
I would, all the brotherhood is restricted for my circle. Brotherhood, when we talk about, is within my circle. As soon as it goes against my circle or far beyond my circle, brotherhood doesn't exist. But what did Prophet Sallallahu say? What do you talk about? What kind of brotherhood we talk about? Whoever says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and then he doesn't reject anything. He doesn't reject anything from Quran and Sunnah directly. Then you consider him as Muslim. Regardless of what some of the opinions he may have, he's still a Muslim. He may be Shafi'i, he may be Hanafi, he may be Hanbali, he may be Salafi, he may be even from any line. But still, all of us are brothers in Islam. We are the Abna of Islam. We are the, the, the children of Islam. And our identity, our ultimate identity is the Muslim. Every one of us, we unite in Haram. If you want to see the, the Muslim, you go and see in Mecca al mukarramah you, you go and see at the time of Hajj. And whoever you see there in Haram, right, then when you come out, you can't just say this guy is not Muslim. If he's not Muslim, he wouldn't be in Haram. Am I right or wrong? So we all pray together, regardless of our backgrounds, our, 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 our faith, our belief. I mean, obviously, Islamic, within the Islamic circle. But we all meet up in Haram and we show them the most ultimate level of uh, unity at the time of Hajj. Uh, and of course at the time of Eid and in Masajid in general as well. So we must learn how to be polite when we come to correct with Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Muhammad, Muhammad Rasulullah, وَالَّذِينَ مَعْهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارُ وَحَمَاءُ وَيْنَهُمْ The number of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people around him, they are strong with, with enemies of, his, of Islam. And they are compassionate amongst their brothers. But we, as Muslims, we are opposite, as I said. We have dialogues, we have tolerance with people from other faith, and that is good. I don't mean to say that we should do that. But I mean, when we come to Muslim, we are really rude and harsh, and we don't speak to each other properly with tolerance and mercy. And as Prophet said, that if you're not going to enter into Jannah unless you're a believer, and you're not going to become a believer until you learn how to love one another. And then he said, أَوَلَا أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِذَا فَعَلْتُمُهُ تَحَابَبْتُمْ He said, am I not going to teach you something that will benefit you and something that will teach you to love one another? And then he said, that is أَشْرُ السَّلَامَ بَيْنَكُمْ Say salam to one another frequently and all the time. Say salam, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have these diseases that we need to really get rid of. Unless we disease, we solve these problems, we are not going to be united. Meaning we have to get rid of all those issues that we have. Some of us, we just, subhanAllah, I mean, it's never been the case. None of the scholars of Islam ever claim that we are the only people of haqq. Believe me, Imam, even Imam uh, Shafi'i, Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Ibn Ghazali, all these scholars that always used to say, we believe we are on the stronger opinion, but the other opinion has the possibility to be right as well. And that's how much humble is the hand. But many of us today, we, have that, we don't have that room to facilitate and include people from other opinions or other scholarly opinions. So this is number two. Number one, I said competition mentality. Always we are competing with one another in a negative way and not appreciating the work of other people in a good way. Number, th number three, and number three, number two, not brotherly approach, not, no politeness, no tolerance when we come to correct each other, when we come to speak and do nasiha and counsel and do advice to other people, other Muslims. We have no tolerance. And number three, not mentioning the difference of opinions among the scholars when we come to do the bayan. And that goes to actually the scholars. This is not a subject of the, not subject of, 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 of normal or ordinary Muslims. It is a subject of the scholars and preachers and jurists and muftis, fuqaha and jurists, right? We, of course, there are societies where we shouldn't talk about the difference of opinions. Can I ask one of the brothers to help me with uh, what kind of societies that we should not really speak much about the difference of opinions? Because we know the difference of opinions and ikhtilaf amongst the scholars are again derived from the Qur'an and Sunnah. None of the scholars spoke out of the Qur'an and Sunnah. Some of them may be weaker and some of them may be stronger, but every one of them, they root back to the Qur'an and the and the Sunnah of Rasulullah But let me ask you, where do you think that we shouldn't speak about the difference of opinions? In what kind of society? 
Anybody can help me? If a society is completely like, for instance, like society has only people from one ethnicity or one background, like say you are living in a village in Bangladesh or in Pakistan, or you're living in a village in Egypt or Algeria or Morocco, right? And everybody knows, everybody is, 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 uh, is aware of what they're doing. There's no mixture of, of races. There's no mixture of, there's no diversity in Simple. There's no diversity. In those societies, there's no need for, uh, you know, talking about difference of opinions because if you talk about the difference of opinion amongst the laymen, the ordinary people, it will create more division and problems than actually unity and love. Because people are not ready to understand the difference of opinions because they haven't studied. They're not yet in that situation. But because I think we live at a time of the media, we live in a time, in a modern time, when communication has gone really strong, everybody's access to internet, everyone has access to many, many different sources of, of Islamic knowledge, and we have access to many scholars from different parts. the main main issues we must tell the difference of opinions amongst the scholars the reason why we should give the difference of opinions I say I mean uh, the reason why we should de uh, explain the difference of opinions because for instance like I have some students and I come and say that um, the Salat Tarawih examples can make it easy or the, uh, the method the examples can, will make it easy for our, our audience and, and viewers. Um, so if I come and say to my students, the Salat al-Tarawih is eight rakats only. And that's the only opinion. And that's the haq, truth. Then I have another scholar who is probably better than me, just out there in another, or, 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 or in, in next masjid. And he's saying, Salat al-Tarawih is 20. Whoever's doing eight is bidah, is innovation, is wrong. Now where do the people ordinary people go. How do they verify these matters? Because they have no knowledge of, of Arabic language, let alone the knowledge of Fiqh and, and Quran and Hadith. No knowledge of even like basic Arabic. How would they be able to judge? And I hear ex continuously from people, we are getting fed up of these divisions or these contradictory opinions amongst the scholars. We are getting fed up. We just don't know how to, where to go. And I hear this from people every time. Wherever I go, some people say, Giving ta'awiz is shit, absolutely. And some people say, no, it's allowed. Some people differentiate. How, where do we go? The people say. And that's a complaint from people. How, where do we go? And therefore, I think it's important to be fair and to be honest and to give the opinions amongst the scholars that scholars differ in many, many ways. And including the issue of ta'awiz, for example, the scholars of Islam, they have different opinions. We must learn at least that there are different opinions. If we do appreciate and accept the different opinions, then we are saving a, a big deal of disunity, a big deal of, of, of the problems in society, in, in, in amongst the Ummah in general. Right? So, mentioning different opinions when answering a question or a, a, a matter, clarifying a matter, is highly important in order to uh, protect and in order to save the important concept of unity amongst the Muslim Ummah. Right. I give you an example. Okay. So as for the Tarawih, Salat Tarawih, this is one example from many, many issues that we, uh, Muslims are actually, uh, they, they, they are confused with. One example I give. This is a, a fatwa I have taken from uh, uh, from the website of Sheikh Saleh al munajid a great uh, Palestinian scholar but he resides in Saudi Arabia for many many years. He's very well known in Saudi. Sheikh Saleh al munajid a Hafizullah, great scholar of Islam. In his website, and that's a very reliable website for many things, you know, you can, people can refer and, and, and it's run by very reliable scholars. In his uh, website he says regarding the Taraweeh issue. I'll give you examples so it makes it easy. نظر إلى أقوال العلماء في المذاهب المعتبرة تبين لك أن الأمر في هذا واسع. When you look at the Islamic schools like madhabs, different schools of thoughts, that you find that the matter of taraweeh when it comes to the number is 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 alhamdulillah expanded. It's not really rigid at uh, one thing. And this one no لا حرج في الزيادة على 11 ركعة. And they said there's no problem because he is 
uh, uh, with the opinion of eight, as far as I am concerned. But he is saying that there is no an issue of praying more than 11 rakat, which is eight plus three, of course, 11. And he said there is no problem praying more than 11. And then he mentions the Qala Imam Sarasi, who is an Imam of Hanafi, a great scholar of Hanafi school, Imam Sarasi, rahmahullah. He says, فَإِنَّهَا عِشْرُونَ رَكْعَةً سِوَى الْوِتْرَ عَلَيْنَا He said that it is according to us, for عِنْدَنَا It is according to us, 20, excluding the wither to us as Hanafi school, in, in, in Hanafi method. And then, فَإِنَّهَا عِشْرُونَ رَكْعَةً سِوَى الْعِدْرَ عِنْدَنَا الْوِتْرَ عِنْدَنَا In Mabsur, it is famous book, Al-Mabsur. And then, Ibn Qudama, a great scholar of Hanbali school. وَالْمُخْتَارُ عِنْدَ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Ibn Qudama, rahmahullah, a great Hanbali scholar is saying, وَالْمُخْتَارُ عِنْدَ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ يعني الإمام أحمد What is selected or what is taken by Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, rahmahullah, فيها عشرون ركعة, 20 ركعات. وَبِهَذَا قَالَ الثَّوْرِ And that is also agreed by Imam Thawri, وأبو حنيفة, والشافعي, وقال مالك, ستة وثلاثون. And Imam Malik is another opinion which says 36 ركعات. Imagine 36 ركعات. Imam Malik is this opinion as well. And that's mentioned in the book Al-Mughni li Imam Ibn Qudama, rahmahullah, the great scholar of Hanbali school. وقال النووي, a great scholar from the Shafi school, Imam Al-Nawi, rahmahullah. Salat al-Tarawih, sunnatun bijma' al-ulama. The Salat al-Tarawih is sunnah according to or unanimously agreed by the scholars. وَمَذْهَبُنَا أَنَّهَا عِشْرُونَ رَكْعَةً And our understanding of the Tarawih is 20 rakat. بِعَشْرِ تَسْلِيمًا with 10 salams وَتَجُوزُ مُنْفَرِدًا وَجَمَاعَةً and it is allowed to be performed individually and in congregation. So you can see easily these are the scholars and mentioned in the books of the reliable scholars of Islam. From the reliable scholars of the Madai, Imam Sarasi, Imam al these are not these are not normal people. Again, now when we come to speak, some of our brothers and some of our sisters, I don't mean to say there's also opinion of each class, and I respect that. If people pray eight, it's fine, fair enough. Let's respect one another. Let's res learn to respect each other. Because it has become an opinion, even though it may not be in the early stage, but it has become an opinion amongst many scholars. But to come and say that aid is just not part of Islam and over praying aid is innovation, I would say this is wrong. And at the same time, those who say 20 is wrong, then they are also rejecting the mainstream opinion of the scholars of Islam. And they are mentioned in the books of reliable books of Islam. And, and how I don't, I don't understand how so many of us we can just speak like that without knowledge. And this is again. This fatwa I've taken is written by, uh, or it's mentioned in the website of Al Imam uh, uh, Sheikh Saleh Al Munajid, uh, a great Palestinian uh, scholar who resides in Saudi Arabia. Right. So that's one example. So if we don't explain these different opinions amongst the, the, the public, amongst Muslims, then people will continuously fight. It. They will be continuously fighting. Take the example of two of the Rabi'i al Awwal, the issue of of uh, Laylatul Bara'a, Nusm al Sha'ban, the 59th of Sha'ban, and we've got many, many issues, and this is just not one. And even people, uh, you know, unfortunately fight over whether to put hands on the chest or below the navel or above the navel or even to raise the hands in every time we're moving. All of these opinions are there, to mentioned and debated by the rightly guided scholars of Islam. Uh, or to say, I'm in love or softly, and some people they make huge issues on those very. Uh, in Islam, there's nothing minor, but when we compare with other issues, then they're minor. Compare with the fara'id, compare with the wajibat, the, uh, the compulsory action. If somebody does rafa'il yadayin, that raises the hands in every movement, it's not going to break the salah. And if someone doesn't do it, it's not going to break the salah. These are just better men. Some say it's better to do, and others say no, it's not better to do. Say, same again, I mean, if someone says amin mean, loudly, it's not going to affect the salah. But we have to be careful where we are as well, because again, Sometimes some ordinary people, those who don't have much access to knowledge, they can misunderstand. And we have to again respect the society and respect the unity of the society. I give you an example. I was in Egypt when I went to Egypt first in Cairo. I was given the opportunity to give Adhan and Iqam in, in a local masjid. So what I did, I gave Adhan loud, obviously, loud uh, in, in the microphone. And of course, in the Muslim world, you know, like people can hear from outside. And then I was giving Iqama. And again, also in Iqama, Egypt goes outside as well, outside the masjid. So when I was giving Iqama, I was giving according to the Hanafi way because that's how I've been taught and I've learned. 
from my this early um, stay age. Then when people came, they said, like, why did you give Adhan twice today? Because in Shafi'i school, you have to give once. Like, Allah Akbar Allah, Allah Akbar Allah, wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasul. Once. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala falah. Like that. In Hanaf school, you give twice. Like Adhan, very similar to Adhan. People start saying, the elderly people, the Hajjaj, the Hajjis, they say, like, why did you give Adhan twice today? I said, no, I didn't give Iqamah. He goes, no, that's not Iqamah, that's Adhan. <laughs> and then I said, from that day I learned, it is important to respect the community of people because these are still, again, within the Islamic schools. And so this, therefore, it, there's no need to change if it's causing the disunity and fitna, the tribulation, or if it's causing the facade and corruption amongst the Muslims or amongst the believers. This is more harmful than the benefit. So not mentioning the difference of opinions, and I think one example is enough to understand that when scholars speak, I urge that we mention the difference of opinions. Say, this is the opinion of some scholar and this is the opinion of the other scholars and they both exist. Whatever you think is suitable for you, or you can even say that I think this is a stronger opinion. That's fine. This has been the practice of the scholars all the time. This is, my, this is the stronger opinion. I mean, I believe that this is stronger, but there, are, there is also opinions. And this way you're saving a person from many, many confusions. Right. Another thing that also causes, uh, that causes disunity amongst the Ummah is again when it comes to mention the Hadith, it's a big debate amongst the, amongst the Muslims. That we say, okay, this is the opinion of the scholars of, of for example, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Al Ghazali, and that's his Hadith, that's his evidence. So then, the, then someone might say, okay, this is weak Hadith. So, this is weak Hadith. And uh, we must not accept weak hadith. And that's how someone may reject. But we forget a very important fact here. And this causing much, much problems in the Muslim world, amongst Muslims. That we fail to understand that when it comes to say the hadith is weak or strong, it is also efforts of the Imams. Some of the hadith are uh, a strong and authentic according to Imam, uh, Imam al-Bukhari but it's weak amongst probably according to Imam for example Imam al-Nasai or Imam ibn Majah some of the hadith are authenticated by Imam ibn Majah or Imam al-Tirmidhi but again it's, 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 it's considered as weak by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim and that's how it's an effort of the Imams to identify whether the hadith is strong or weak this is also a human effort that we forget so there are different opinions amongst the scholars of hadith with regards to the degree or the status of hadith whether it's strong or weak there are different opinions not everybody will agree on a hadith that is, is absolutely agreed some of the hadith are agreed but some hadith are different by when it comes to the, uh, identify or classify whether it's weak or strong now a major difference of opinion amongst the scholars with regards to weak hadith are all the weak hadiths rejected? Are all the weak narrations of Prophet ﷺ rejected? Brothers? No. no. And many of us, there are unfortunately many people who say they're all rejected. And if it's a weak hadith, then don't take it, don't accept it. And again, we are causing a lot of problems amongst the Muslim Ummah by not mentioning that not all the weak hadith are rejected. I'll give you some of the uh, evidences. So it says here, وَقَدْ أَجَازَ بَعْضُ الْفُقَهَاءَ الْعَمَلْ بِهَا فِي الْأَحْكَامِ الشَّرْعِيَّةِ إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي الْبَابِ مَا هُوَ أَقْوَى مِنْهَا كَالْحَنَافِيَّةِ وَالْحَنَابِلَةِ بَلْ وَجُلُّ الْمَذَاهِبِ That, according to the vast majority jurists of Al-Islam, Sharia, talking about Abu Ahmed bin Hanbal, Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam, uh, Imam uh, all the major scholars, Imam Malik, all the major scholars, they say that it is allowed to take the weak ahadith of course, with conditions, as long as they're not too weak, there are some conditions, there are some criteria as well. But it is allowed to accept the <coughs> hadith if there are not strong hadith in that subject, in that, in that given subject. And then, يعني يجوز روايتها في مثل المواعظ That it is allowed to narrate with hadith, with narrations, in giving speech, like wa'az, like, you know, the, 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 the hidayah, the normal nasiha. Encouragement, motivation, speech, 
الترهيب وني والقصص وما أشبه ذلك to narrate a story for example then with a hadith are taken and even it, it has been mentioned that Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal sometimes used to use with a hadith to derive the fiqh rulings as well but majority of the scholars they say with a hadith cannot be taken in the matter of aqidah in the solid matter of deen we cannot take with a hadith and we cannot make rules like farq or wajib or haram based on the with a hadith but in the things like normal uh, uh, like motivational speech to encourage people to deen to Islam the scholars, vast majority scholars of Islam accept the with ahadith yes again on the other side some scholars reject it some scholars they say it is better not to accept the with ahadith like Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi and some other scholars as well and of course many modern contemporary scholars they believe that it's better not to take the with ahadith but I don't mean to say that it's wrong the other opinion is wrong but I mean, when we come to speak, then at least we say that there are scholars and they are very reliable and the even majority, even the scholars saying Tudul Madai, the majority of the scholars would accept the wit hadith when it comes to al mawaid when it comes to wa'ad, when it comes to motivation, nasiha and speech and also al-qasas creating a story uh, or maybe stories. At least mention that. I remember, like for instance, I give an example. There is a hadith which says Ramadan awwalu rahmah wa awsatuhu maghfirah wa akhir wa atiku minan na I'm sure if you, many of you have heard that heard of the hadith meaning that Ramadan the first 10 days is rahmah the second 10 days is maghfirah the, the, the forgiveness and the, 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 the third 10 days the third portion is najat right? freeing oneself from the fire of hell now this hadith we've been hearing and we've, I've heard from whole my life since I'm, I've been like I've, I've, I've started to understand things right? and we hear every time but somebody one of the dua preachers one day come and says this is not a hadith and for the first time I hear and he said this is not a hadith then I thought to myself am I hearing myself as a student of knowledge I was very confused I thought like, so was I hearing all these days like bad things or something that is wrong and I've heard from the mouth of the big scholars mashaykh and then I went and actually looked into the hadith. Actually, the hadith, the status of hadith is weak. But because it's not related to any, any, any rulings of Islam, it doesn't, it's not related to haram or halal or wajib or farq or, kifra or prohibition or, or compulsory actions or even aqidah. It's just to encourage people. And of course, it has a ground. It's mentioned in the books of hadith. So now, when I looked into the hadith, I've seen that it's da'if, but it's not, it's not, it's not mawzu'a. It's not fabricated. It's not a false hadith. If it's a false hadith, then it has to be avoided completely. But if it's a weak hadith, then it can be taken again with the criterions of the scholars of hadith. Now, I myself was really confused. And then when I looked at the hadith, I said, SubhanAllah, now what the normal people would think, the person who doesn't have the access to knowledge, how would he deal with this problem? He would be in dilemma. He would be in, in, in complete dark, in darkness. Again, now, the hadith are different types. And the weak hadith can be accepted according to the vast number of the scholars with regards to uh, the fawa'il uh, al-a'mal in the virtuous deeds. Now, unless we explain this, people will keep on fighting and fighting and they're not going to know why they're fighting even. People are not going to understand why people are fighting, why they're disunited, why they hate one another. They're not going to know because they're not going to know causes. And the last thing, I'm taking too much of time, sorry, but inshallah, the last thing I would, I would like to say that the tendency of labeling people very quickly with names. So for example, we have two important major issues in our religion, which is shirk and bid'ah, right? So shirk is, everybody agrees that shirk is a major sin. No one disagrees with the, 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 the sin of shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Noble Quran, Inna Allah la yukhru bihi wa yakhru ma duna dhalika min nisha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives everything, every sin except the sin of shirk, unless the person gets rid of the shirk. So this is how nobody denies, nobody, uh, 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 nobody says uh, or doesn't understand the, the importance or the greatness of the sin of shirk. And also al bidah innovation. Again, innovation is a great sin. And our uh, Prophet said, Every innovation is a misguidance, and misguidance soon leads to the fire of hell, Jahannam. <coughs> the way these two important concepts 
in Islam are very sinful. Sorry, but I, I want to ask a quick question. Um, um, we'll come to the question. Yeah, inshallah. We'll come to it. So, the way this, the innovation, the ship, are really uh, uh, dangerous in the religion, but I also think at the same time, it is really dangerous to label very quickly somebody with the word, or under the project of ship, mushrik or muftadi or innovator. Why? The reason why. First of all, when you call somebody quickly mushrik, it means you are taking him out of the fold of Islam. Meaning, how many people actually have you managed to convert to Islam? You're taking everybody out of the fold of Islam. You have to be very careful. It's, we must fear Allah wa ta'ala. We must not taqi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi had al amr. That we must not hasten in labeling people with the word ashim. Because if the person is not a mushri, then imagine like what can happen to you. And again, with the word or with the matter of al bid'ah. So we have a tendency of calling people mubtadi'ah or innovators very quickly. Al bid'ah. Al bid'ah. Okay? Very, very quickly. Now we have to understand. Not everything that you may assume is shirk is agreed by all the scholars. Again, the matter has different opinions. Not everything that you may think is bid'ah, there are some bid'ah agreed by all the scholars. Like for instance, according to Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah, if you're putting a stone while you're giving sijda, like some other outside Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah people do, then that's bid'ah according to all the Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. Agreed. But there are matters within the Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah differed by. And if it's again different by, we must not do respect. So something may seem to be bid'ah to that scholar, but it's not, it may not seem to be bid'ah according to other scholars. And again, it's a matter of again, ikhtilaf amongst the scholars. And we must be very careful. We must fear Allah wa ta'ala when we come to label people with the word shirk and bid'ah, because sin, soon, very quickly, we are putting them into the fire of hell. And this way we can never be united. I know there are Bid'ah amongst the people, amongst Muslims, there are shit amongst the Muslims. We have to correct them and we have to, of course, fix these problems correctly with, with again, with hikmah, with, uh, with compassionate, with tolerance, and with love and affection as brothers, right? As brothers uh, and sisters in Islam. Uh, just because obviously people are making mistakes, that doesn't mean, again, we speak, them, speak to them harshly. You're mushrik, you're muqtadiya. No, this way we cannot. It is really hard to change people in this way. Nasiha must be given according to the prophetic way, prophetic tradition. Prophet was never harsh. Even with the munafiqeen. He knew the munafiqeen in Masjid al Nabawi, but he even still prayed janazah on them, many of them. SubhanAllah, this is Prophet. He knew, like munafiqeen hypocrites, but he was still not harsh and bad with these people, let alone, of course, people who are. So now, I don't mean to say there is no innovation, and I don't mean to say that innovations are wrong, they absolutely dislike, and of course, Prophet said, But scholars of Islam spoke about bid'ah and shirk very in detail. It's not exactly black and white. Even some scholars, they said, bid'ah are two types, there are good bid'ah and there are bad bid'ah. For example, we're using the microphone today. Did Prophet Asim use the microphone? Now, it's a good bid'ah. We have to use it. Unless we use it, how can we uh, reach to people? Why are we using media, internet? Why are we using like the modern tools of media? There's a bid'ah, a good bid'ah. So there are different types of bid'ah we have to understand. And, uh, and even like for example, Quran, the way we recite today, the form of the Quran and Kareem. If I come and say, brother, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't read in this Quran, it's bid'ah. Because he had, he was, it wasn't in this form at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was in different form, on leaves and stones and things. It's a good bid'ah. So, Scholars of Islam, namely Imam al-Shafi, he said bid'ah hasana and bid'ah sayyida. There are good bid'ah, which is good innovations, and there are of course bad innovations that of course must be avoided. And even when he spoke about Imam al-Shafi and others, when, when they spoke about like taraweeh, uh, 20 rakat, because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi don't forget, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never prayed taraweeh in congregation. If you want to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you must pray individually. You don't come to masjid. Because Prophet Sallallahu never prayed in congregation. He prayed at home. And he only came to Masjid three days. And the rest of the days he prayed at home. This is something was initiated and instructed by Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab who was a Khalifa of Islam. Again, a role model. And when Amr ibn Khattab united and gathered all the Muslim Sahaba عنه, under, or, uh, behind Bayy ibn Ka'ab was the best Hafid at that time. He said, Ni'mat al-Bid'ah. What a beautiful innovation. 
because everybody prayed behind Ubay ibn Ka'b and the instruction of Prophet Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab 20 rakat behind Sahaba in congregation. So not everything that we say or we may assume is bid'ah or bad bid'ah. There are different types of bid'ah for the scholars of Islam. And this word, I'm very grateful to Alpha Dawa Project and also uh, Shahjalal, Subhi Shahjalal Masjid and to you all brothers and sisters for taking part in this event. Jazakumullah khairan.